Hello everyone, my name is Professor Deborah Terry and I'm the Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Queensland. As I'm recording this message in Brisbane, Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants. While I would have liked to have joined you in person, unfortunately that's just not possible in these socially distanced times. Nonetheless, I expect that there will be a silver lining in live streaming this lecture. I hope that it will allow even more people to enjoy the lecture from Brisbane and around the world. This lecture is named in honour of the late Paul Francis Burke, a former president of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, or ASA as it's known. Paul was a distinguished historian and an academic with an impressive grasp of a range of social science disciplines. Every year, ASA selects four Paul Burke Award recipients based on their contribution to advancing public policy in the social sciences. It is an award for early career academics who show incredible promise, but who do not yet hold an associate professor or professorial appointment. The award recipients are then asked to deliver the Paul Burke Lecture at their home university. So I am delighted to be here to introduce this Paul Burke Lecture, featuring Dr. Rebecca Ananian Welsh. Rebecca is a constitutional law scholar and senior lecturer at the University of Queensland, who has a dual expertise in the Australian judiciary and national security law. She has published widely in these fields, including two edited collections and regular contributions to Australia's leading legal journals, including the Sydney Law Review, Melbourne University Law Review and Public Law Review. She's also the co-author of a book, The Tim Carmody Affair, Australia's Greatest Judicial Crisis, which was shortlisted for a Queensland Literary Award in 2017. Last year was a stellar year for Rebecca. Not only did she receive the Paul Burke Award, she was also presented with a Faculty Research Award here at UQ in recognition of her research into national security, press freedom and fair trial rights. Rebecca's research is currently focused on the impact of national security law on press freedom, and that's also the subject of her Paul Burke lecture today. Of course, this is a very topical issue for our democracy right now, given recent police raids on journalists and the debate here in Australia around finding the right legal settings that give protection for both press freedom and national security. Rebecca has chosen to take a different approach for her lecture today by holding it in conversation with her colleague, Professor Peter Grester. Peter is an award-winning foreign correspondent and the UNESCO Chair in Journalism and Communications in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at UQ. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Professor Peter Grester and Dr. Rebecca Ananian Welsh for this important discussion on press freedom and national security. Hi there, my name is Professor Peter Grester and my formal title, what sometimes feels like a rather pompous title, is UNESCO Chair in Journalism and Communication. I'm joined by Dr. Rebecca Ananian Welsh, who's a colleague of mine in the law school and mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot of work together looking at legislative reform, looking at the kinds of laws um, that affect press freedom. And Beck, I suppose the first thing is to talk about the recently released report from the PJCAS, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which I have here, this rather fat 170-odd pages of, of report, which is, its formal title is Inquiry into the Impact of the Exercise of Law Enforcement and Intelligence Powers on the Freedom of the Press. A fairly chunky title. You've had a chance to look through the recommendations. What, what's your reaction to that? Uh, so this, this was the first report of many, I think, we're going to be seeing from the government. Um, the PJCIS, that's the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Which is a big committee. A it's chunky a title for a, a, for a chunky report. Um, that is, that's the government's intelligence committee. So they're used to looking at bills, every national security bill that comes up, they look, look at it and consider it, whether it's necessary and proportionate. 
here in the wake of the AFP raids in 2019, they were asked to do something quite different. And that is report on press freedom generally under Australia's law enforcement and intelligence powers. So what's your reaction? I mean, there are some fairly sweeping recommendations in here. We'll talk about the detail of it a little mm -hmm. bit later. But overall, what does it tell you about the, the state of press freedom and national security? Really, it, it confirms what we, those of us who've been looking at it, already knew, which is that there are massive problems across Australian law uh, with the way that press freedom is recognised and protected. So the 177 pages speak to 16 recommendations that cover whistleblowers, freedom of information, shield laws, uh, warrant procedures, all sorts of defences for journalists, <laughs> crosses all sorts of different areas of law and says, in these areas, press freedom is not protected. And that's one of the key things, I think, because remember when the report, or when the committee was originally commissioned to, to investigate this, mm -hmm. We had the Prime Minister and Minister for Home Affairs all saying, well, look, this isn't such a big deal. We'll have a look at it because there's some pressure um, on, on us to, to, to investigate this stuff. But the, the law works fine. We've got pr uh, press freedom in Australia. This report suggests otherwise, doesn't it? Yeah. Look, no one had high hopes for this report coming up with much. It's a government-controlled committee. Um, and that's why there were other inquiries, including out of the Senate, convened. And even this kind of bare minimum report in terms of reform has said transparency could be much better. Journalist protections could be much better. Um, so it's identified the areas, areas for reform. So let's go back a little bit to what led up to this mm. report. Now, we know that the report was triggered by two infamous raids by the Australian Federal Police on journalists. Yep. And, um, June last year, I think it was. Yeah. But you and I have been looking at this stuff long before then. Um, again, let's let's talk a little bit about what the state of the law was mm. in back in 2018 when we started investigating. Uh, or we can go even further back. Look, it's hard to go back far enough. Press freedom is one of those things that is an integral part of... Um, just our liberal democratic system of government. So the fourth estate, that idea comes out of, out of the UK and their constitutionalism. But if we go back to kind of 2001, um, with the Twin Towers falling September 11, that moment that shocked the world, Australia had no counterterrorism law at that point. Uh, there was one, sorry, in the Northern Territory, had never been used, but nationally, zero counterterrorism laws. What followed is what Professor Kent Roach has called a period of hyper-legislation, mm -hmm. where Australia today and within 10 years became the country in the world with more counter-terrorism law than any other country. So we're talking even more than North Korea, we're talking more than authoritarian states that yeah. we've come to know and love, like China and, and so Well, on. the thing is that those kinds of, so and the, the US approached it in the same way, those countries that have an authoritarian or, or very executive power focused system don't need a lot of legislation. So the, the US declared the war on terror and suddenly the president got wartime type powers to do whatever needed to be done. Here we didn't have that. So instead we had parliament and at that point it was the Howard government who controlled both houses of parliament, handing one power at a time over to the executive mm. government. So for a period of the Howard government, uh, there was, and George Williams has done the maths, um, on average, one new terrorism law being introduced and enacted every 6.7 weeks. Which is phenomenal. Yeah, and these were complicated pieces of legislation. And now I think that the latest tally is, is at least 82 separate pieces of legislation, which, yeah. which feels ridiculous in terms of just a sheer volume. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, and that's not just volume. So that's more counterterrorism laws than anywhere else in the world. It's also uh, the depth of these laws. So we're the only country that enables our domestic intelligence agency, ASIO, to compulsorily interrogate non-suspects in a terrorism investigation. And so they can take non-suspects in for interrogation and secretively force them to answer questions. You go to jail if you don't answer the question. We're the only country that does that. 
Um, there's a lot of other things that we've borrowed from other countries, control orders, preventive detention orders, the list goes on and on and on. And, and we've seen this trend where extreme laws will be introduced to fight an extreme threat. And then gradually they normalize and we see a new kind of extreme, like citizenship stripping um, introduced. And then that might normalize and we start to see new extremes over the last 20 years. But just to be clear, not every one of those 82 pieces of legislation limits press freedom, but they all in some respect, in some way small or large, I think, still have an impact on civil liberties and mm. some of the more abstract ideas like freedom of expression and so on. So because they're within that national security framework, they're all quite secretive. And in that just pure openness sense, I guess there's, a, there's an impact on what people know and you're increasing government powers and you're coupling that with secrecy. So in a loose sense, yes, it all impacts how much we know about government powers. Um, but no, there are, more, there are some laws that are particularly concerning for press freedom. So in, this, in, in that context, it's important, I think, to know that Australia has another kind of point of uniqueness in the world which is that we're the only Western liberal democracy without national codified rights protection. Well, again, we'll come to that in a minute, but one of the things that I, I noticed, I mean, I, I started thinking about these things in 2014 when I was in prison in Egypt, and we were in prison on terrorism charges, and on paper, the legislation looked pretty solid. Mm. It was fairly standard national security legislation, anti-terrorism legislation that prohibited terrorist activity, promoting terrorist ideology and so on. But the definitions in that law were so loose, it was so loosely framed that the government was able to take it and effectively come after us as journalists. We were accused of, of promoting terrorist ideology, of broadcasting fake news with intent to undermine national security, a whole host of pieces of, of law that effectively equated journalism, the kind of journalism that we were doing, which was holding the government to account and speaking to all of the parties, all of the, the political groups in the country, with a, 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 an act of terrorism. And I realised that, in fact, even though Australia wasn't going down, wasn't look about to become Egypt any time soon, there were parallels in there. Mm. Now, that was the way I saw it. Was that, do you think that was being a little bit extreme? In terms of the laws and the powers that exist, no. No, it's not being extreme. Uh, something that the whole system rests on is discretion and trust. So we have a lot of these powers, but they're not necessarily used. And built into some pieces of legislation is kind of a last resort clause. So take that power, that unique power, to de secretly detain non-suspects, for ASIO to detain and interrogate non-suspects. The detention part of that has never been used. And so our system has evolved in this, we're going to grant huge kinds of powers to government to fight terrorism um, because they need important powers to fight terrorism. And we're going to trust that they will only use it in a proportionate, necessary way, which may be not very often. So one of the laws that, that I think we were particularly concerned about was the data retention legislation, which gave the government the capacity, or what the government did was was um, passed a piece of law legislation that compelled telecommunications companies, mm -hmm. internet providers, to retain the metadata of every Australian for at least two years. And it gave a host of government agencies, I think it was about 21, 22, yep. um, access to that metadata without a warrant. Yeah. Now, at the time, the government said that that was to make sure that the, the, the security agencies had the capacity to intercept terrorist communications and it would only be used for those kinds of, those kinds of investigations. They said, at, what, or at least what journalists were concerned about was the way in which it exposed their, their, their relationship to sources and the government said, ah, we're never going to use it for journalists, that's not what this is about, don't be ridiculous. Yeah. Were those concerns? <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, data retention and data surveillance is the perfect counterpoint to the ASIO detention powers, I think. Um, in that first scenario, powers have either never been used or rarely been used. Data surveillance and, and access to metadata, we're talking a thousand accesses to metadata a day. 
Uh, but hang on, <laughs> let's just pause and, <laughs> and absorb what that really means for a moment. Mm. A host of government agencies have asked f for access to Australian metadata mm. 1,000 times every single day of the year. So one of the issues there was uh, you're, obliging, you're obliging telecommunications companies to keep this metadata, but in, it was a list of data. So one of the issues was they actually had to create some of this metadata as well. So you've got this huge pool of data and all you need to be able to access it is authorization from your boss, basically. And so there's all sorts of different uses that could be put to, and also that limited list of original agencies was expanded by kind of local and state governments um, coming up with other reasons why they might want to access this metadata. So somehow that number got to about 360,000 accesses of metadata a year. And these are things like, it's not the content of your communication, but it's the time that you send a text message, it's the geolocation of your phone, it's, uh, it's what t who you called, the number you called, and what time you called it, and where you were when you called it. Real data about the way that you live your life. Very concerning for journalists, because it's very easy to put together when people were communicating with each other, or when they were in the same place at the same time, um, from metadata alone. And you can cross-check an awful lot of other stuff. You, you know, if you, if you cross-check perhaps the websites that a, that a journalist is looking at, you cross-check um, some of the other phone calls that they might make to other sources, other contacts related to the story mm -hmm. around the same sort of time, you can put together a very rich picture, not just of who people are communicating with, but the kinds of subjects that they're interested in, the, poli the, the political interests, the mm. kinds of stories that they're looking at, all sorts of stuff that is so rich. I remember when I was researching for my book, I found a, an extraordinary quote from a former director of the CIA who said they actually mm. issue um, kill orders based on purely on metadata. So this is very, very rich detail indeed. Yeah. It does protect journalists though. So this is also another a scenario where one of the rare pieces of legislation where the government has introduced a protection for journalists, not in the original draft, but the media organisations and through the PJCIS kind of submission inquiry process advocated so strongly that this would be the end of source confidentiality, that there is a warrant required called a journalist information warrant. Um, that warrant is only required when the agency wants to access the metadata for the purpose, for the direct purpose of using it to identify the journalist's confidential source. So they can still use metadata to identify the source, but they do have to get an inf a journalist information warrant first. So journalists have nothing to worry about then? <laughs> uh, there's a whole, so at least, uh, look, it's, a, it's an important safeguard. It's a, it's a judge that's involved. Journalists have slightly less to worry about than the rest of Australian citizens when it comes to data access. But here's one of the things, that, that concession for journalist information warrants was introduced after the media complained about it. And as a part of that process, there's a really key element called a public interest advocate mm. who in the law is supposed to, well, do what it says on the tin, advocate for the public interest. Yeah. Um, the trouble is that that whole process is completely secret and the advocates are never able, never allowed to approach the journalists mm. themselves. So a lot of journalists were saying that, that those provisions, those so-called protections for their relationship with their sources really wasn't that great. And anyway, is there anything stopping the security agencies from investigating the metadata of a likely source if they can't get access to a journalist? Yeah, nothing at all stopping them from doing that. Um, and what's more is later pieces of legislation which are really complicated and technical and again introduced urgently and, um, and with post-introduction kind of reviews allow the agencies to get around the encryption that journalists were using to protect themselves and their sources. So it's a, it's a safeguard but it's not, it's not the best one in the world, it's not a robust one and it is far weaker than anything we see in comparable kinds of democracies like the UK and New Zealand.
So what are some of the other pieces of legislation? Well, let's talk for a moment about that, that journalist source relationship. Mm. Um, we have shield laws, of course, which is supposed to give Well, Queensland doesn't. Well, <laughs> <laughs> everyone apart from Queensland yeah. has shield laws that are supposed to allow journalists the, the, the right to refuse to reveal their sources in court unless the judge decides that there is a compelling reason to override that. Yeah. Um, shouldn't that be enough? That principle that shield that, that journalists have the right to protect sources be be enough? Yes, yeah, shield laws were a fantastic introduction in the uniform evidence kind of scheme. So they're relatively recent, 2011, 2012. Um, and as you say, in court, so in that judicial kind of setting, uh, the journalist or media organisation is doesn't have to reveal information that would identify a confidential source. And there's a public interest test around that. Here though, certainly, look, in Queensland, we don't have them at all. Um, the way, let me tell you about how it works in Victoria. That's a, that's a good kind of counterpoint. In Victoria, they had the shield laws and that works like a, a privilege, like legal professional privilege or something like that. Um, a protection for confidentiality. So even when a search warrant is issued, the police won't able be able to access that information either, unless it's that public interest kind of test is applied. Um, so a really robust privilege there. In New Zealand, um, the same thing kind of exists. In the rest of Australia, so not Queensland, not Victoria, and certainly in the federal level, there's the protection in court, but that doesn't go any further which means that in a police investigation, the police or, or other authorities, I suppose, can, can fulfill the investigation, get a search warrant, access the journalist's information, identify their source, and then think about pressing charges. So it really weakens, it's a backdoor around those protections in court because the police can just access the information in an investigation. So effectively what you're arguing is that for for the principle behind a shield law, that really important relationship between journalists and their sources mm. um, that needs to be protected so that, so that sources can have confidence that when they're speaking to the press um, on important matters of public interest, they're safe, their identity yeah. is safe. That principle is relatively meaningless if all of the other laws that lie behind that mean that the authorities can still access that information can still find out who is speaking to, to a journalist. Mm, so we've got this tension going on where journalists, and I don't need to tell you this, <laughs> journalists have the core ethical obligation to protect their sources and without sources uh, and without sources who feel safe, the capacity to do good public interest journalism that, that holds the powerful to account, that reveals the stories, that tells those stories is really inhibited. So journalists have an ethical obligation to do that. They're able to fulfill that eth ethical obligation in court, but when they're faced with um, covert surveillance by not just police, a whole raft of government agencies, um, their metadata might be accessed and identify their source without them even knowing about it. And then what we didn't think would happen until 2019 perhaps, if the police just all out raid journalists and conduct searches supported by a warrant and in the warrant process there's no need to consider source confidentiality, the police can just get that warrant, access everything they need to access, identify the source and prosecute the source or prosecute the journalists without shield laws coming into play. Look, there are plenty of people in the government, a lot of politicians said, look, this is all hypothetical, it's all rubbish, you know, you guys are, are bleating about stuff that um, that you needn't, that's unnecessary. Anyone who opens up the Australian newspapers can see pretty quickly that we've got a free press. Mm. Is that fair, do you think? It, it was until the 5th of June 2019 or the 4th of June. Um, there was that sense, I know when we started this research uh, six months before the AFP raids, of we're going to look at all the laws and identify potential impacts how these laws could be used against journalists. And then the impacts of that were being felt in an in a intangible kind of way, this, this chilling effect, this idea that 
I'm doing something that might cross the line into, into criminal conduct or working with this source might get us in trouble. I've got to be careful. But once you had those two days of daylight raids on Australian journalists searching through emails and, and underwear drawers to try and identify confidential sources, the reality of it, I think, really kicked in, um, that this wasn't theoretical. Mm. These were actual powers that the police were deciding to use against actual journalists. But you use the, word, the phrase chilling effect. I think one of the problems here is that it's really difficult to quantify a negative, to yeah. quantify, to kind of understand stories that are not told, think stories that get killed off because sources get scared or journalists get nervous or the lawyers decide that if we go ahead with a particular story, we simply won't be able to afford to pay for the legal fees mm. if we ended up in court as a result of this. And generally, just briefly on that, the lawyers that we've interviewed um, usually lawyers have a pretty good risk assessment, kind of, they're not completely risk averse. All right, defamation, let's run that story, it's important to run, we'll wear the costs, they'll weigh it up. Criminal prosecution, it's a different matter. If you're going to run the risk of a journalist going to jail, that's not a, we can't afford the, that's a, we're not going to do this, kind of, yeah. So that's the legal advice they were getting. Sorry. No, that's okay. No, so, so, in the, so the, the net effect, though, yeah. is that in fact journalism was clearly and demonstrably being being choked off, if you like, for want of a better term. Yeah, it was, um, and so we paired this up with empirical research. Having looked at the at the laws, we then turned to actually speaking to the journalists, and that's the only way I think to measure a negative. And it was a similar kind of exercise to what we've been doing. Uh, with counterterrorism law and human rights since September 11, 2005, with new tranches of law. How do you measure, these laws are definitely impacting rights, how do you measure whether they're also stopping terrorism? This is a different kind of, of balancing act or, or investigation. How do you measure how many stories aren't being told? And the way we've been able to do it is to talk to the journalists who are saying, I am not telling stories that I know need to be told. The other thing, though, that is trickier to, me tr trickier to measure is the chilling effect on sources. So how many whistleblowers are not blowing the whistle? How many instances of misconduct are not being revealed um, out, of, out of fear or that, that of the repercussions? So you don't need to have soldiers or police in jackboots marching into journalists' offices for that chilling effect to, to happen. Mm. And it only needs to happen once or twice in a very public way for that message also to filter through to people who might be considering talking to journalists. Yeah, the, the removal of that guarantee of source confidentiality is a big thing. And I think if anyone thinks to themselves, would I talk to a journalist about what's going on at my workplace? Um, the answer to that for everyone is probably very different if you think I'm allowed to say to that journalist oh, This is anonymous or I or there's no way I can say that to the journalist And if you're you have to put your name on it to talk about say misconduct at work or something like that and Put your name to it. That's a bigger. That's a big decision That will undoubtedly have flow-on effects rather than being able to say look this is anonymous But I can give you solid information that's what we're working with here. And journalists aren't in a position anymore because of data surveillance um, primarily. And because I, I guess they know now that the police might just walk in in jackboots mm. <laughs> to really guarantee source confidentiality. So that was a kind of a framework that led up to uh, mm. June last year when the Australian Federal Police went to the home of News Corp journalist Annika Smethers and the ABC headquarters in Ultimo, mm. both looking at stories that involved confidential leaks, leaks of confidential, in fact, classified documents mm. from government agencies that revealed things that I think has been universally recognised as being in the public interest. We don't need to go too much into the detail of those stories here, but mm. they triggered this particular PJCIS inquiry and the report that we've just seen. Um, Let's have a look at some of the recommendations from the report in more detail. Yep. 
One of them is the, pub the concept of public or expanding the concept of the public interest advocates that we've just been talking about in a way that um, guarantees that they will be, or that, that um, they will be very senior um, legal figures, QCs, Queen's Councils or senior councils, yeah. um, that they have to have hearings before um, a, a higher court judge mm -hmm. or federal court judge, um, that uh, they need to, to have these kinds of hearings for all cases involving national security uh, and journalists. Yeah. Enough? <laughs> it's a great step. Um, so this is just in the warrant proceedings. So once you actually get into something that you need a warrant for, and we've already heard there are things that you don't need warrants for, um, but if you do need a warrant, if you want to access communications, if it's about journalists, what the media organisations and advocates were asking for was a contested hearing, which may sound anathema to, to say, we're going to get a search warrant over you. Uh, do you want to contest it? Um, just might sound like an excuse to start the shredders. But it hasn't been what's panned out in, in places that they already have that, like mm -hmm. the UK. Uh, so that's what they were asking for. I think what the PJCIS has done here is, is compromise um, in a very considered way, which the first and maybe the biggest thing that that does is acknowledge that the existing warrant procedure is really problematic mm. and does nothing to protect press freedom. And if they needed any extra proof for that, the search warrant over Annika Smethurst was unanimously struck down as invalid by the High Court purely because it was so sloppily drafted. It failed to even properly describe the investigation, the offence being investigated. So something was needed, but they weren't prepared to go to proper contested warrant proceedings. Um, and instead they've introduced or expanded this public interest advocate. Fantastic that it's a senior legal professional because they're the only ones who are going to be really capable of working with really tricky concepts like source confidentiality versus law enforcement. That's not easy. Um, great that it's before a judge. That's a big advancement. Not so great. I, I would have liked to have seen it contested, I think, uh, because lawyers function off instructions from their clients. Lawyers aren't expected to be an expert in the thing that they're arguing. They're expected to have their client there who's able to tell them, well, these are the issues, this is what's happening, and I then represent them in the best way. And so this isn't a replacement for that. But at the end of the day, this really falls short because it still has uh, confidential journalistic materials up for grabs under a search warrant. The starting point is, yes, it's going to be whatever necessary for the law enforcement investigation, unless there's a compelling public interest why we shouldn't. In, if ex shield laws are extended, as they are in Victoria, New Zealand, the UK, elsewhere, um, then the starting point would be, this is a confidential journalistic material, which is the, the very core of press freedom, you can't get it unless you can show us a compelling public interest, terrorism investigation, national security imperative, something bad is about to happen, then we'll let you have it. And that starting point, I think, needs to be different so and more important. So the burden of proof falls to the intelligence agencies, the security agencies, to show why they should be accessing that data and violating the principle of, of, of con source um, journalist confidentiality. Mm, it's not, I'm being a lawyer here, <laughs> it's not really a burden of proof thing because they're the only people in the room. So there's no one else to carry the burden of proof. So it's a pure one-on-one -on -one between the judge and the, the agency. So they already have to show valid grounds, but they have to show this is going to be substantially useful in the investigation. And then the, then it's, the public interest in the investigation is made out and you're waiting for a compelling other public interest. And you don't think the public interest advocate can fill that role sufficiently on behalf of the journalists? I think it would be a far more appropriate starting point to say confidential journalistic materials are privileged in the same way that legal professional privilege would apply to this kind of scenario. Um, that's privileged, it's off limits, 
unless you've got some very good decision, a, a judge saying, no, there's a compelling public interest here, which outweighs, which is already the test in shield laws, it outweighs the public interest in source confidentiality. So let's go through some of the other recommendations, some of the, the highlights, there are 16, as you said, there are 16 in all, we won't go through them um, on a point by point basis, but there was also a wide ranging review of national security legislation mm. um, and its impact on press freedom. Yeah, they, there have been a lot of reviews of national security legislation mm. uh, with 82 different laws almost every one of them, if not all of them, would have been referred to the PJCIS, would have been considered for its human rights implications. Um, in that context though, press freedom was sometimes raised, but not often. Uh, and so we see things like data surveillance, it actually got some traction when it was raised. What this has done is put press freedom on the map as a core democratic right, um, if not, if not actual just right, human right, a core cool part of our democracy. And so one of the recommendations, yes, is, oh, while the Attorney General's Department is conducting a wholesale review of counterterrorism national security law, you need to include press freedom in that. Which one nods to the fact that it hasn't been, that it's an issue, that there are problems with press freedom. And two, nods to the fact that we really haven't thoroughly done this yet. So what it's saying is that there needs that, that we need to embed somehow the principle of press freedom into our legal code, particularly when it deals with national security. So the way that we've justified, um, the way the Australian system works in, without a Bill of Rights or a National Charter of Rights is on the idea that human rights are a political issue and that as each piece of legislation is introduced into Parliament, it'll be debated and Parliament will consider the rights implications and weigh them up and introduce them into the legislation. That works sometimes but not all the time and when you're introducing a new piece of legislation every average 6.7 weeks, it's hard to even do the, the freedom from torture, freedom from arbitrary detention, right to a fair trial kind of analysis let alone also turning to how is this going to impact source confidentiality. So it's just been overlooked, I think, at this point. This is the backtrack to re-look at all of those pieces of legislation and go ask the question fresh. Um, and yes, try and post hoc build in systems for taking account of press freedom in amongst all the other rights that have to be taken account of. Do you think there's a much more elegant way of doing this? That's going to be so. There's 82 pieces of counterterrorism legislation we've been talking about, and that's a number that's easy to throw around. There's over 40 different kinds of warrant. Um, and then there's the entire Commonwealth Criminal Code. So Dan Oakes, uh, one of the ABC journalists who was unnamed in the warrant um, in the AFP raids last year, has been charged with receipt of stolen Commonwealth property. And when you were drafting the receipt of stolen goods yeah. offence, whenever that was, was not introduced... not going to put a journalist defence in there, are you? No media organisation <laughs> is going to rock up and say, this is, this is going to be a major issue for, for media organisation. Yeah. We receive stolen goods all the all time. time. <laughs> it's just no one thought of that. No one saw it coming. So the task is gargantuan of considering every separate Commonwealth offence for its impact on press freedom. The, the alternative option, which is actually the option that works in most other places around the world in liberal democracy, is that you say clearly and once somewhere, um, or at least once, press freedom is a fundamental aspect of our system and needs to be considered um, whenever courts are interpreting legislation. Or whenever the legislators are drafting And legislation. whenever it's being drafted, yes. Um, so when you're drafting legislation, when you're exercising a discretion, uh, including prosecutorial discretions, but, but the whole range of discretions, when agencies are making decisions, when courts are interpreting legislation, it, here's a list of things they should be considering and taking the least restrictive approach and press freedom should be one of them. But I think here what's needed is something even stronger than that. And we see 
the beginnings of this acknowledgement um, in the official secrets kind of offence that we have, which got a revamp in 2018. So the secrecy offence um, has a defence in it for journalism. So the secrecy offence relates to criminalisers basically handling national security or classified information. Um, and it's a defence to say, I was doing that in the course of legitimate news reporting. And that's a good indication of what, what a defence for, for, for legitimate journalism could look like. And the PJCIS, even this inquiry that no one really expected to, to come up with much, has said as one of its recommendations that the government needs to consider um, the extension of that kind of defence to other criminal offences. But the elegant way that we've been that we've been talking about, you and I have been discussing, is, yeah. is the idea if you can't have a constitutional amendment, which is always going to be incredibly <laughs> difficult in yeah. Australia. Uh, which baby steps. Baby, baby steps. <laughs> um, is a Media Freedom Act that yeah. wouldn't quite be the same as a constitutional amendment, but would still establish those principles in law. Yeah, and we'd have press freedom recognised as part of the Australian constitutional framework. Um, when the constitution was being drafted, there was this idea that you didn't need to write down these things because we're all gentlemen and of course we will respect this because of good old UK tradition. And I think the, what we know now is that you do, minorities, um, the indigenous people of Australia, um, uh, and here the press, can sometimes have, if those rights aren't written down, they can be eroded. And so having that statement that says, press freedom is part of our constitutional system. We recognise it in a piece of legislation. It's got some teeth. It's a bit of a no brainer. <laughs> Let's hope that the, the, uh, the PJCAS and the parliament also <laughs> <laughs> accept we'll and understand that. That's a great place to leave it, Beck. Thank you very much oh, thank for, you. for joining us. And uh, I hope you've